Good morning. Welcome to Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a community of diverse beliefs and experiences, nurturing the liberal religious spirit and united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whomever you are, whomever you love, whatever your life's journey, you are welcome here. I'm David Peel, the worship associate today. Our service is led by our minister, Reverend Sharon Wiley, our music musician this morning is the invisible Mr. Tim McKnight, who will be in, uh, providing music for us uh, via recording, pre-recording. And let's see, our song leader is Laura Brown. Our tech team in the back there is Jake Deoc, Hope Campbell, and Dean Goodett. And our greeters out on the table this morning were Susan Lewallen and Paul Courtright. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. Welcome to those of you here in the chapel and welcome to those of you who are zooming in online. Shana Tova. This week included the observation and celebration of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year that started at sundown on Wednesday and ended at sundown on Friday. Happy New Year, and may you find the forgiveness you seek and ponder a meaningful future. Our service this morning deals with how we think about the phase of life we call death and dying. For those of you here in the chapel, feel free to wear a mask or to step outside, whatever makes you comfortable, and know that if you do go outside, you'll be able to still hear what's happening inside here. We are always delighted to see newcomers joining us in worship. Uh, if you might be interested in the groups and activities we offer, uh, you can find those in our email newsletter and online calendar. Uh, online newcomers, you will receive an email invitation uh, to join the email list after the service. And uh, in-person newcomers, if you haven't already given us that list, uh, that your email address, not the list, uh, when you signed in, please consider sharing your email with us before you leave. Our weekly email uh, and newsletter is really the nicest, best way to get the information about the many groups and activities we have to offer here at Chalice. Now let's take a breath together. Now we light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. I'd like to invite Marshall Fogel up to light the chalice this morning. Each week, we light this chalice. Its light and warmth are present now for us to experience and share, and each week, we extinguish it. We neither dread nor mourn the extinguishing. We know it must go out until we gather again. And we trust that it will be lit again. We do not forget the sight of it or what it stands for. Such is life.
the words of our call to worship. All week long, day in and day out, we rush from moment to moment, meeting to meeting, task to task. Our work, our to-do list, is rarely done. This morning, perhaps, you rushed here, another task, another appointment to keep. May this be an hour to slow. May this be an hour to breathe and sing and rest. May this be a moment to contemplate, may this be an hour to contemplate moments and difficulties and challenges that have rushed by. May this be an hour that restores you and strengthens you for the week ahead. May this hour together nourish and sustain you for all that you face in days and weeks to come. Let us worship together. I have a song for us this morning we um, may remember hearing during the pandemic from a singer-songwriter, Leah Morris, called Keep Your Heart Wide Open. We're going to sing that a cappella this morning. I'm going to invite you to stay seated so you can, um, uh, you'll see me snapping because that's what's easiest for me up here. We'll get the, the lyrics up, but you can tap your uh, legs or clap along as you feel comfortable and inspired. Can we see the lyrics? There we go. So notice that both these verses are essentially the same. Um, one is saying, keep your heart wide open. The other one is saying, I'm going to keep my heart wide open. So we're uh, invited to sort of sing these, you know, these lyrics don't have to be sung perfectly. Um, so you may sing keep or you may sing gonna keep. Uh, You've got to keep, I'm going to keep. Uh, though the waves want to push you around, although the waves want to push me around. So, the, um, so yeah, it's meant to be sung, you know, as you feel called to sing it. So I'll, I'm going to sing, sing it first so we can hear it. And then what I'm going to sing is I'm going to sing it through fully two times. So we're going to sing five verses, if that makes sense. You'll listen the first time. Um, yeah. And I invite you, you know, I wanted to offer this this morning because I feel like this is a good song to be able to call up, particularly in the next month approaching the election as we're feeling like a lot's happening in the world. So I hope this is one to keep with you. Keep your heart wide open Though the waves want to push you around you've got to keep your heart wide open till your faith brings you back to solid ground keep your heart wide open want to push you around you've got to keep your heart wide open till your faith brings you back to solid ground i'm gonna keep my heart wide open want to push me around I'm gonna keep my heart wide open until my faith brings me back to solid ground keep your heart wide open to push you around you've got to keep your heart wide open till your faith 
brings you back to solid ground. I'm gonna keep my heart wide open. Although the waves want to push me around, I'm gonna keep my heart wide open until my faith brings me back to solid ground. Sing that last line again. Until my faith brings me back to solid ground. May it be so. <laughs> Our Sunday worship is the shared spiritual practice of our community, and we tend to the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring our joys and sorrows. Here in the chapel, you're welcome to write your joy or sorrow onto a candle card, which will be collected from you. Online, please feel free to write your joy or sorrow, including your name, in the chat box. These joys and sorrows will be spoken out loud, and then we will remove this part of the service from the recording that goes onto our YouTube channel, so this sharing won't be publicly available. If you'd like to send Reverend Sharon uh, a confidential note about your joys or sorrow, or to make a prayer request, please email her, and her email address will be on the screen in a moment for that. Please enjoy some of that invisible Tim for a few minutes while you write, your, uh, write down your joys and sorrows.
So we'll light a final pillar candle this morning for all the joys and sorrows that may go unshared and unspoken. These two are held in the love and support of our community. So now we'd like to invite the children and anyone else who would like to come forward for our story. Our story is called Water Bugs and Dragonflies by Doris Stickney. Down below the surface of a quiet pond lived a little colony of water bugs. They were a happy colony living far away from the sun. For many months they were very busy, scurrying over the soft mud on the bottom of the pond. They did notice that every once in a while one of their colony seemed to lose interest in going about with its friends. Clinging to the stem of a pond lily, it gradually moved out of sight and was seen no more. Look, said one of the water bugs to another, one of our colony is climbing up the lily stalk. Where do you suppose she is going? Up, 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 she went slowly. Even as they watched, the water bug disappeared from sight. Her friends waited and waited, but she didn't return. That's funny, said one water bug to another. Wasn't she happy here? asked a second water bug. Where do you suppose she went? wondered a third. No one had an answer. They were greatly puzzled. Finally, one of the water bugs, a leader in the colony, gathered his friends together. I have an idea. The next one of us who climbs up the lily stalk must promise to come back and tell us where he or she went and why. We promise, they said solemnly. One spring day, not long after, the very water bug who had suggested the plan found himself climbing up the lily stalk. Up, up, up he went. Before he knew what was happening, he had broken through the surface of the water and fallen onto the broad green lily pad above. Weary from his journey, he slept. When he awoke, he looked about with surprise. He couldn't believe what he saw. A startling change had come to his old body. His movement revealed four silver wings and a long tail. Even as he struggled, he felt an impulse to move his wings. The warmth of the sun soon dried the moisture from the new body. He moved his wings again and suddenly found himself up above the water. He had become a dragonfly. Swooping and dipping in great curves, he flew through the air. He felt exhilarated in the new atmosphere. By and by, the new dragonfly lighted happily on a lily pad to rest. Then it was that he chanced to look below to the bottom of the pond. Why, he was right above his old friends, the water bugs. There they were, scurrying about, just as he had been doing some time before. Then the dragonfly remembered the promise. The next one of us who climbs up the lily stalk will come back and tell where he or she went and why. Without thinking, the dragonfly darted down. Suddenly he hit the surface of the water and bounced away. Now that he was a dragonfly, he could no longer go into the water. I can't return, he said in dismay. I tried, but I can't keep my promise. Even if I could go back, not one of the water bugs would know me in my new body. I guess I'll just have to wait until they become dragonflies too. Then they'll understand what happened to me and where I went. And the dragonfly winged off happily into its wonderful new world of sun and air. Please join in singing the children to their classes. Wander your path with a song so sweet that everywhere you go there is love all around. Walk on your path with a song so sweet that everywhere you go there is love.
What happens when we die is, of course, one of the great mysteries that we live with. And no matter what、uh, our mind might think about that question, or what our heart feels and believes, the answer is that we don't know. We don't know what happens when we die.、Uh, science can explain the decline of the body, our physical death, our physical decay. But of course, many of us wonder: What about this energy, this spirit or soul that makes me me and you you,、uh, and each of us different, unique people? Does that energy just end, or does something else happen to it?、Um, our, you know, and as Unitarian Universalists. We might individually have our own sort of cycles of thinking about that, and our different ways,、uh, our different beliefs about the answer to that question. But it's sort of fundamentally less interesting to us as a faith tradition than it is to many other faith traditions. Right?、Um, we don't have a teaching that an, an affirmation or an assertion that X Y Z happens. When we die, we're free to believe whatever we believe as individuals. And in my 12 years here, this is the first time that I've explicitly talked about it,、um, because there's not a lot of common ground for us. Our theological history as Unitarian Universalists, Universalist refers to the belief that of universal salvation, that we are all saved, that God does not、uh, punish us to an eternal. Uh, hell. Uh, there are forms of universalism that have believe, and maybe some individual people believe that you might、um, there might be some punishment for mistakes you make in this lifetime, but that it's finite. You would sort of pay your dues, and then you could move on <laughs>、uh, to、um, paradise or heaven, however we picture that. And of course, there's many other beliefs besides that.、Um, Reincarnation is a very common belief, and that can take a lot of permutations. I mean, all of these beliefs can have a lot of different flavors and individual nuances. And you know, one way of thinking about reincarnation is that it's another system of reward or punishment, and、uh, you know, not the punishment of a judging God, but sort of karmic,、uh, karmic retribution. And you can be reincarnated, in, in particularly in Buddhist belief systems, as part, maybe human or animal or or a god, assuming there's many gods, spirits, and then sort of the worst thing you can be reincarnated as is a hungry ghost, a sort of state of perpetual emptiness and yearning,、um, yes, to be avoided at all costs. And you know, other faith traditions, particularly you know, in different places of the world, have ideas that the world gets reincarnated, and that you know, time is cyclical and passes in eras, and that maybe we relive things together. So pretty much anything you can imagine,、uh, you know, there are people who believe that and center their lives on that. For us, it's I think it's an important question because what we think. About what happens at the end of life shapes how we live, and we will have people here who、uh, know people or grew up in traditions that are very fearful, and that living is a lot about fearing death and what comes next,、um, and trying to guess the right things you're supposed to do or the right religion you're supposed to believe to avoid、uh, the punishment that might come、uh, come after. So I think it's one of the、um, one of the things I love about Unitarian Universalism is that it always pushes me to broaden,、uh, you know, what I think and who I think could be here. So I could imagine, you know, six or seven years ago, and there might have been times that I said that, like, well, you know, if you believe in it in a judging、uh, or an angry God and punishment, that this isn't really going to be the place for you, and. You know, I think we could hold that. You're not going to find a lot of people who believe that with you, or see that reflected much in our worship. We we've just affirmed a set of values that includes love at the center, and for many of us, that expression of love includes the idea of a loving God, and a loving God takes away that fear of what comes next.、Um, but yeah, I sort of think you can believe any of those things, and it's. Um, yes, and also let me lift up that there are faith traditions, 
you know, who just sort of aren't interested in a specific vision. Uh, I think uh, Judaism, the afterlife is called Shoal, if I'm pronouncing that right. But you know, there's not a. It's just it's just a next place of being. It's not a place of reward or punishment, and it's not that particularly interesting, right? It's not central to a lot of their theological questions. So yeah. So you're going to hear me mention, I've already done it, but it, it'll come up again, the idea that there's a thinking we have about it, sort of our intellectual ideas, but then there's what our heart believes. And those aren't always synchronous, right? As you know, people who do a lot of thinking and reading and pondering, we might uh, rationalize certain beliefs, but, but then we can sometimes find that like our body doesn't really believe it. So our heart, how what our heart feels and believes uh, can be different sometimes. And that's particularly why I wanted to talk about this topic. Um, I'm with people in our congregation as they near the end of life. And for some folks, some fears come up of things they were taught when they were younger, or even just things they've heard, you know, sudden, and those, that sense of regret, or are there things they could have done differently or should have? And is there something to fear in what comes next? And I think of that as a case of, you know, there, their mind has taught them for many years that they believe X, Y, Z, but as they approach end of life, they find that their heart has some fears and worries that they sort of tried to uh, talk themselves out of. So I think it's good to periodically give our full attention to these questions and sort of see, you know, what does my mind think? What does my heart think? However natural death is, there's still something um, a little, uh, that can feel scary about thinking about that, particularly if you have never been with someone at the end of life um, and haven't lost someone close to you. I can remember having a conversation when I was a hospital chaplain, having dinner with some friends who were asking me about my work. And one of them said, have you, have you been there when someone has died? And I said, yes. And then there was just sort of a silence um, I don't know what their next question was, but I felt there was sort of a spooky discomfort at the table that I didn't know how to address. Um, I've been with many people at the end of life, and whatever feels scary about it is something that I've lost track of. Um, I feel very blessed to have been with people at the end of their natural lives rather than having something unnatural happen to them. And it can feel peaceful, and there are many people who feel that they're ready to go when it's time. And as we had an Ask Me Anything service last month, and I received a written question, what do I believe happens when we die? And I realized in that flash that what my mind has thought, what I've said for many years, is that I believe in reincarnation, because I think um, I like the idea that we have things to learn, and it may take us multiple tries and multiple lifetimes to figure it out. But that my heart has come to believe something else, and I hadn't taken time to examine that. So I just wanted to share some of my thoughts with you this morning, knowing that each of us here is going to have our own experiences and our own beliefs about what happens when we die, and that's sort of the essence of Unitarian Universalism. But right, I'm a minister, I've had some experiences, and I think that's what's begun to change uh, what I think. And, and the, other, the other piece that I want to lift up before I start, I think the, um, the, the part of this work is to align what we think happens to other people with what we think happens to us, right? <laughs> Those things should be the same things, right? But uh, <laughs> again, when our folks you know, when I've been with folks who start to fear death, and I'll ask them, well, do you think that's what happens to other people? Are they going to be punished for? And like, no. Yeah, so, so that's part of, part of why this takes some reflection. What are we thinking happens to other people? What do we think happens to us? So I think probably the first thing that I started to notice was when I've been with people who've had a loss, people who consider themselves, um, I don't know, pragmatists or humanists, uh, you know, I don't know how, always how they describe themselves, but feeling surprised that they feel that they sometimes feel their loved one still with them or still in the room. And what they're wrestling with me, their minister, about is, I didn't think I believed this, right? 
I thought <laughs> death was something else, but I'm feeling my loved one with me. Um, and I've heard that from many people. And, you know, as a minister, I just encourage them not to worry about it. <laughs> and if it's comforting, if it's comforting, just enjoy that sense of comfort. And then often when I'm with people near the end of life, I'm with the family and being in the room and sort of helping people cope and get through that. But I sometimes get the opportunity to sit alone with the person who's dying. And they're usually not talking and present. They're in an active dying state and breathing slowly. And, and I, I have that feeling that like the air feels a little different in that space. I feel like I'm in a different space than sort of regular space. I just want to savor the blessing of talking about death while we have a baby in the room. <laughs> and that feeling of, right, it's part of multi-generational community. We get to see all of the stages of life. So I hope she can stay in the room. We're blessed by the sound of her. Um, but that feeling that I'm in a different space, and so I've come to feel that that's a liminal space and that the person I'm with is making a transition to something next. And so, you know, these aren't things that I had thought beforehand, but my experience is starting to uh, feel that there is something that comes next and we transition there. And the space and the time of that transition creates an energy that, I, that feels different to me sitting there. Um, so that's informed what I believe, and hopefully now what I'm coming to think about. And then my mom died a few years ago, my father-in-law died in June, and in their services, I, you know, called them ancestors now, and referred to them as being in a place where they are able to offer us wisdom and guidance and love. And so, you know, I guess that's what I'm starting to think and believe and feel. Um, and as many of you shared when I spoke about this a few weeks ago uh, in passing, believing that we can still be in touch with our ancestors and loved ones doesn't mean that you can't believe in reincarnation. Um, for me, it feels like I'm letting go of the idea of reincarnation. That doesn't mean you have to let go of the idea of reincarnation, uh, but I'm just really relating more to the idea of ancestors. And so I was even thinking this morning, you know, for me, it feels like those loved ones, I'm picturing, imagining that some of their struggles have dropped away and they're able to be a version of themselves that's able to, in, in this next life, realm, whatever you want to call it, world, that they're able to offer me a wisdom and guidance that they might not have been fully able to offer when they were here in this lifetime. But I don't think that happens for everybody, right? So we've heard people tell stories of feeling spirits or energy that feel like they intend harm or aren't fully here. So this is very new for me to think about, and that's probably the next thing that I'll be sort of pondering as I look through the world, what people who work with ancestors as part of their belief system will tell you to exercise caution around sort of invoking ancestors. They may not all intend you goodwill. Uh, some of them <laughs> may not be able to do that. So yeah, this is all new for me to think about. So that's what I'll be uh, yeah, sort of sitting with for a while. What we think about death and what happens next informs and shapes how we live. Again, we probably know and can see people who are living in fear and um, the sort of the heaviness that that puts on people to feel like there's punishment for things they can't guess, they hope they've picked the right religion, are going to sort of double down on that and, um, you know, judge the rest of us. And all of that, I think, just comes from such a profound dis-ease and um, uncenteredness. I hope that as Unitarian Universalists, we don't fear what comes next, that whatever it is, I mean, dying is natural and inevitable for all of us. And it seems to me, whatever comes next is not something to be fearful of. 
I think our work is to live, and we don't want to live so much in the next life that we neglect living fully in this life. For all of the imperfections in the world, for all the things we would like to do better, this life is a blessing. It's joyfulness, beauty is around us, the wonder and love between us in our community. And, you know, in the, the famous saying from Alice Walker's Color Purple, it pisses God off if you walk by the color purple and don't stop and notice it. There's so much to savor and enjoy. And I hope that our faith is it, part of our work as, as Unitarian Universalists is to lift that up to each other over and over again and call us back to that appreciation for what is wonderful around us, for the work of helping make sure everyone has access to this beauty and wonder, to work of justice seeking, to work of caring for one another. Um, and so that when the time comes, that it's time to say goodbye and transition to what's next, that we can say goodbye without regrets uh, and with peace at knowing that we live fully. That is my hope and my prayer for all of us. May it be so. You're invited to rise in body or spirit to join in singing. The Sunday offering is an expression of generosity that makes our congregational life possible. As Buddhist teacher Sharon Salzberg writes, generosity is characterized by the inner quality of letting go and relinquishing. 
being able to let go, to give up, to renounce, to give generously, these capacities spring from the same source within us. When we practice generosity, we open to all of these liberating qualities simultaneously. We encourage you to text your donation to Chalice. If you haven't texted a donation before, once you text the amount, you'll get a reply with a link to enter your credit card information. If your Sunday donation is meant to be part of your pledge payment, please be sure to indicate pledge after the dollar amount. And the phone number for text donations will be on screen in a moment. But if you prefer to make a donation, uh, in an in-person donation by cash or check, there are envelopes and a donation box over by the chapel doors there, and you can leave those donations on your way out. Please give generously. Please join in dedicating the words, our offering, with the words of affirmation here. At Chalice UU Congregation, love is at the center of everything we do. The words of our prayer come from the Reverend Richard Fuchs. Source of life and death, ground of all being, spirit of our spirits, whose we are in life and in death. Life itself is the great mystery, and death a part of it. In truth, we know not the one nor the other. We live and die in the mystery of being from moment to moment, till at the end we merge with the universe and marry the all in one, the one in all. We pray for ourselves this day. May we be more kind, tolerant, and charitable toward one another and all with whom we share this globe of love and laughter and tears. Knowing our mortal frame that we have no given day with certainty, may we be more ready to lend a helping hand, make someone's life a little easier and happier by what we do or say, bequeath a kinder and fairer earth than we received. And at the last, bless the giver and receiver of life for all we have 
and are in this world and in the world to come. Amen. Our closing hymn is from UU uh, musician, is performed by UU musician Matt Meyer. You can listen, he'll sing the first verse through and then we'll join him when he adds the drum beat and we'll go from there. Let the life I lead speak for me. Let the life I lead speak for me. When I'm lying in my grave and there's nothing more to say, let the life I lead Our closing words this morning come from Elton John's The Circle of Life. I bet you know the tune, but do you remember the words? From the day we arrive on the planet and blinking step into the sun, there's more to see than can ever be seen, more to do than can ever be done. There's far too much to take in here, more to find than can ever be found.
But the sun rolling high through the sapphire sky keeps great and small on the endless round. It's the circle of life. It moves through us all, through despair and hope, through faith and love, till we find our place on the path unwinding in the circle, the circle of life. Love and blessings to each of you. You're invited to close our time together by singing the well. After our closing hymns, please hang on to your seat for a couple of announcements. <laughs>